G'day and welcome to this four part video series on ceramic bridging. Bridging is a very important part of the building structure and it ensures that you get the most out of your purlins and girts. Bridging does a number of things. It holds the purlins straight, keeps them aligned and resists twisting that can be induced in the purlins when they are loaded. At Stramit, we've developed a boltless bridging system and in the first video, I'll show you the parts that make up the system. This will give you a better understanding of how a stranded bridging system works and how it all goes together. Firstly, stranded bridging is very versatile. There are only a few components, but these components can be used in many different ways. Stranded bridging can be installed up the slope or down the slope, depending on what you prefer, not what we prefer. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the components that make up the bridging system. This is the locator and it's easy to recognise because of its two prongs. This is the first part of the bridging that touches the purlin when you are installing. They come in a range of sizes to suit 100mm, 150, 200 and 250mm purlins. This locator and all the parts I'm showing you here today are for the 200mm purlins. The prongs on the locator are set up at the right position to work with the holes punched in your purlin, including the 16mm spacing in Victoria. If you look very carefully at the ends of these two prongs, they have a small spring. These springs are very important because it's the part that clips onto the purlin and makes the system safe to use. This is the lock and this is at the other end of the bridging, locking the system together once you've assembled it. It's easy to recognise because of its square shape and you will notice small tabs on other sides that locks it into place and ensures it's secure. It comes in four standard sizes. The third top of end is the bolted end. For those who prefer to have conventional bridging with bolts at every purlin or where the bridging design suits a bolted end, you can use this bracket at the ends of runs and it's available in four standard sizes. Every piece of bridging needs a bridging channel. This is our standard channel with rounded back to make it safe and easy to use. When you order strand bridging, you'll tell us the purlin spacing and we'll cut the bridging channel to the appropriate size and fit the appropriate ends. You'll notice at each end of the channel, there's a 14 millimeter hole. This butt hole is used for other purposes that we'll talk about later. In addition to our bridging, we've got a wide range of brackets and connectors. This is the bridging starter clip and this is the bracket for attaching to fascia. We also have general purpose brackets and angle connectors. And this is a clamp plate. And this is a raking girt bracket. These parts ensure a complete bridging system, giving you complete versatility in the building you need to construct. I'll show you more of these parts in our later videos. Next we have some bolts. We have three main types available. We have these flat head fascia bolts to go on the outside of fascia purlins. We also have these standard bolts with nuts and washers, as well as flange bolts with integral washers which are much easier to use and are very popular with installers. Stramer supplies fasteners in various grades, lengths and diameters depending on your requirements. The most common bridging is the intermediate. You can see it's a channel with the locator at one end and a lock at the other. We know which direction the bridging goes because the two prongs point in the direction you're going to install it. So we can install it up the slope or down the slope. The three parts of the intermediate bridge member are connected together using the proprietary TOX system. This patented method joins the end plates to the channel without burring, cutting, riveting or welding. This provides a strong joint without the loss of the protective coating so you don't have to worry about corrosion problems in the future. At the roof ridge, we need a ridge bridging. This typically consists of an end plate at each end and with either a lock or a locator depending on whether you're installing up or down the slope. In the middle, there's a turnbuckle, which can be wound in or out 
so you can adjust the spacing between the purlins and get them positioned correctly. At the bottom end of the purlin run, we have this facial bridging. This looks a lot more complicated, but it really isn't. At this end, we have a lock or locator, depending on which way we're installing. And in the middle, we have this slotted channel that allows us to adjust the purlin spacing, take the twist out of the fascia and align it parallel to the other purlins. Now bridging isn't just used in roofs with purlins, it's also used in walls with girts, and this is a girt hanger. It's used to connect the roof bridging with the wall bridging, and also helps to align and stabilise the fascia purlin. You can see that it has a turn buckle, so you can adjust it to the correct height. At the bottom of the girt run, we use a girt foot. The girt foot can be bolted directly to the concrete slab and it transfers the load from the bridging to the floor. It's very important to get the girts horizontal and level because when you screw the wall cladding on the outside, you want to keep all the screw lines running straight and parallel with the ground. This slotted channel on the girt foot allows us to adjust the girt into the exact position that we want. In between the girt foot and the girt hanger, we use standard intermediate bridging, same as that used on the roofs. Finally we have a piece called a swivel bridging. This looks like a standard ordinary piece of bridging. It has a lock and a locator at each end and a channel in the middle. But you'll notice that it uses a single bolt at each end of the channel instead of a tox connection. This allows the bridging to swivel and you can use it as, a, as an expansion joint. Alternatively, swivel bridging can be used on a curved roof and you can vary the angles that the end plates to suit the roof curvature. When you use it this way, each lock and locator must be secured with the tech screw after placement to ensure it doesn't slip after you've tightened the bolt. So that's the components that make up the Strand Bridging System. There's only a small number of parts, but all of the versatility is in how you arrange and connect them. You just move the components around to suit what you want it to do. In our next two videos, we'll show you how to install Strand Bridging on a roof. Mm -hmm.